thank you all. I can thank you all for uh, allowing me to come before you tonight as a free man. Because I was actually at Wall Street at the demonstration this morning uh, in, that tried to get to the stock exchange. Um, <laughs> it was very exciting, but there were trillions of police and the likelihood of getting arrested was very high and a good number of people did get arrested and I could have been one of them but then I said, uh oh, <laughs> feed me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, here I am. But it is an extraordinary uh, moment, one that uh, some of us have been waiting to see for a long time and were puzzled didn't arise earlier because this uh, situation that we live in today of gross uh, inequality and uh, and the gross undermining of democracy has been going on for a very long time, for a generation at least. And it's stunning that there hasn't been uh, the kind of resistance that erupted two months ago and that indeed I think will continue far past today. In fact, I know uh, from uh, 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 sources that include my son and daughter, and that uh, there are thousands of people, even as we meet here tonight, gathered at Foley Square, so many thousand, that as of 6.30, a march that was supposed to have begun at 5, had not yet begun, because it couldn't move out of Foley Square towards the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it was so uh, remarkable from a historian's point of view, and that's mainly what I'm going to talk about today, is, is history, is how this uh, Occupy Wall Street movement renews, refreshes what had died away for a generation and links up with a long tradition uh, in American political and cultural life. And I want to approach the kind of uh, historical framework out of which Occupy Wall Street comes by asking uh, or discussing four questions that are often framed as accusations against Occupy Wall Street. The first is that Occupy Wall Street is somehow, this is the most obvious one, un-American. And you know what? We've, we've grown so unused to seeing mass protest in this country that it has become very easy to characterize such events as somehow antithetical to the way Americans do things. But as a matter of fact, that's not true. And there's a century-long tradition in American life that uh, has again and again uh, directed its resistance energies against the power of Wall Street in particular and of other centers of economic privilege. And you can go all the way back to the beginning, to the birth of the nation. In fact, the first Wall Street panic happens in 1792. The nation has just been born. And it's a panic that's brought on by a man named William Dewar. Dewar was a kind of, uh, he was from British uh, sort of gentry. He made a fortune in America. He supported the revolution, made a lot of money off it, uh, sold the Continental Army a lot of shoddy material, uh, <laughs> or he broke some, some stuff they really needed badly, got to be very rich, uh, was already well to do, and hung out with a circle of, of a similarly privileged New Yorkers, sort of though, that Dutch patroon world and, and Brits Brit like them. Anyway, William Dewar saw his main chance. He was connected, uh, although, uh, to Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary, the most famous Treasury Secretary, who had just then won his battle to issue the first public bonds. We today have become very accustomed to being utterly at the service of the bond market, right? Well, these were the first bonds. Uh, that he felt me, the government needed to issue in order to kind of jumpstart the American economy. Dewar, uh, because he worked within the Treasury Department, although Hamilton did not connive with him, he was a man of considerable integrity, Hamilton was, uh, uh, conspired with his fellow, uh, 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 this is really, you know what this is? This is the first insider trading scam. <laughs> That's what it is. They think they have inside information about the prices at which these, these various government bond issues will be floated when the government issues them. And they, they go deeply into debt. They, they leverage a word we've become very used to today. <laughs> they leverage a heavy investment in these government bonds. They misestimate, that sounds familiar. Uh, they misestimate, they crash. They all go bankrupt, and they bring down with them 
the local New York City economy. And, and the, the day that happens, William Dewar, this uh, patrician, is chased through the streets of where we were this morning. Uh, he's chased through the streets by an angry mob of, uh, you know, uh, ordinary folk, uh, not anarchists, there weren't any in those days, just ordinary folk, who, had they caught him, probably would have hung or disemboweled him. He's, he, he's instead uh, first arrested by the sheriff and carted off to debtor's prison where he dies a few years later. That's the first resistance movement to Wall Street, although there was no, there was Wall Street, but there was no Wall Street the way we think of it now. Uh, and it, it initiates a, a long history of that kind of resistance, so that, for example, in the 1830s, Andrew Jackson and his Democratic Party followers wage a war against what they called the Monster Bank. That's Jackson's, the president's word, for the second bank of the United States, which Jackson and, and the common folk who, uh, who, who, uh, who, uh, who uh, lionized him um, thought of as a as a kind of uh, closed monopoly created by the government to a politically privileged elite that was controlling the credit resources of the country and they wanted it destroyed so that the credit resources of the country would be more widely available to all people. And they won. The bank was uh, uh, extinguished, expired in 1836, and the monster bank was dead. This monster, this unnatural, this unnatural thing. Uh, Lincoln, during the Civil War, became aware of the fact that Wall Street speculators were betting, uh, were, were speculating heavily against government bonds uh, on, the, on, on the thought that, the, uh, hoping for Union Army defeats, which would send the bright price of those bonds plummeting. And Lincoln uh, let it be known that he thought those Wall Street speculators should be shot. Um, <laughs> In, in, in the period after the Civil War, that's when Wall Street becomes truly a serious central institution in our economy. That's when we industrialize. And Wall Street is at the center of that. And right from the outset, even in the 1870s, you have movements like the Greenback Labor Parties in the 1880s, the Knights of Labor, who begin to organize both politically and in the streets against what they call the money power. This power to control, again, financial resources, which say wannabe entrepreneurs need to start up their businesses uh, or farmers need in order to survive at, on the land, to pay off their mortgages, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, by the 1880s and 1890s, uh, we begin to see the growth of uh, the populist movement. The populist movement talked about Wall Street as the great devil fish. Uh, uh, the, the, and the, the, a, as a kind of satanic influence, which from the populist point of view was not only uh, 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 monopolizing economic resources and ex exercising enormous power over the agricultural economy, uh, but also was undermining democracy. Uh, by, you know, back in the 1890s, the Senate was known as the Millionaires Club. Why do we know it as the Millionaires Club? And it's uh, alleged to represent not people but corporations. Sounds familiar, no? Yes, it does. And, 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 they, and the populace uh, invade against Wall Street for, for, for that reason. And probably the, one of the most famous lines in all of American political presidential history was uttered in 1896 by a populist-inspired Democratic Party politician from Nebraska, a man named William Jennings Bryan, who said, uh, and inspired millions by these words, that mankind shall not be crucified on a cross of gold. And he meant by that Wall Street. And the populace were an enormously powerful movement, all through the Great Plains and the Southland of the United States. They elected governors and senators and local officials all over the country and so seriously challenge the power of the street. Um, I should mention also, because I think this is a, a, an appropriate setting in which to make mention of this, that a very sizable portion, you know, the church was divided, Christ, Christian churches were divided. Some of them were apologists for the power of robber barons and Wall Street speculators and so on. And it, one of the most famous speeches uh, uh, ever, ever delivered, I think it was delivered like 10,000 times over the course of 30 years by a man named Russell Conwell, who founded Temple University, it was called Acres of Diamonds. It was about how we could all get rich and, and, and 
and so on, and that, and that the, the amassing of wealth was in, uh, by, by individuals was a good thing for, for society. But there were large parts of the, of, of the church which opposed that, which opposed mammon worship, which upheld the tradition of, uh, of the jubilee, who, who, who uh, that is to say, the jubilee year of the canceling of debts, Periodically, every 70 years or every 50 years, or whatever exactly uh, 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 in biblical times was done. These were people who believed in a moral economy. By this, by the 1890s, uh, uh, the country has been given over to the ideology of the free market, and that the free market is a sort of self-correcting uh, mechanism, which in the end uh, benefits everybody. But uh, 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 the social gospelers, men, men like Washington, Gladys, and, and, other, and others, said, no, we need to impose what our ancestors were familiar with, a moral economy, which talks about a just price and a just wage, not one dictated by the supply and demand uh, of, of the marketplace. And so that social gospel influence was also an enormous part of this resistance to all the fact Gladys talked about three cardinal sins, and the, the chief one he was most worried about was gambling, and by gambling he meant speculation. That is to say, it, it, that was the, the variety of gambling he was most concerned about, in the way that it, it kind of deflected resources away from productive enterprise into the kinds of things that we know. They didn't have credit default swaps then, but had they, that's what he would have, uh, that's what he would have uh, uh, been, uh, been uh, referring to. Um, around that same time and into the turn of the century, we get the antitrust movement. The antitrust movement was, of course, a movement against all kinds of, of monopolies and oligopolies that were forming around the turn of the 20th century in a variety of industries. But the, tr the mother of all trusts, the trust they were most concerned about, was called back then the money trust. The money trust was essentially J.P. Morgan and a handful of white shoe investment banking institutions that all kinds of people, middle class folk, working class people, famous jurists who would go on to become Supreme Court justices like Louis Brandeis, Woodrow Wilson, uh, who, who ran in 1912 for the presidency basically on a, on a platform attacking the power of the money trust. And again, what, was being, what was, they were concerned about is that because Wall Street, it had midwived the industrial, what, what, what we take for granted today, the publicly traded industrial corporations, now we don't take for granted industrial corporations in America, but for a long time we did, uh, that publicly traded industrial corporation was created by Wall Street, and they dominated it. Uh, they were the ones who did the, did the what today we call IPOs, initial public offerings, etc. And they sat on the board of directors, and they and they and they blocked access to credit resources from competitors. They chose or chose not to uh, 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 promote various kinds of technological innovations. They use what Louis Brandeis called other people's money, a phrase that's become part of our lingua franca today, right? It was new then to invest in various schemes of self-enrichment. This money trust, uh, this money trust that Wilson and the antitrust movement and all kinds of people organized this was also seen as an enormous political threat, undermining every institution of government, not just the Senate and Congress as a whole, but the presidency, uh, the, uh, 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 even institutions of higher learning, the mass media, uh, it had its fingers every place. And, and, uh, and, and Brandeis wrote a book, uh, uh, which was called Other People's Money, exposing those, those connections. Um, and, 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 so, and, and then finally, this long century, which begins really in the late 18th century, culminates, uh, oh, I should mention, of course, we don't want to leave out any presidents, that even someone like Theodore Roosevelt uh, denounced people he called malefactors of great wealth. Uh, who were the great uh, trust creators at the turn of the 20th century. And, uh, and, and uh, although he did business with people, he, he did business with people like Morgan, but he also instituted antitrust suits against people like Morgan, and Morgan didn't like it so that when um, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, left office in 1908, and then in 1909, he went on an African safari. You know, he was a big hunter and all that kind of thing. <laughs> I'll tell you more about it.